And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple. Previously, previously known for known for su known for such in, such glorious insanities such as the great American novel and Highcaster, now returning with it with its refine refinement in Dungeon Caster, the one and only Christopher Gray. Don't call him Robin. How you doing tonight, man? <laughs> Hello. Doing really great. I wanted to say congratulations for being the the world's best shit show. Was that the award? The world's greatest shit show. The greatest shit show. I messed that up. But yeah, congratulations. Yeah, That's I'm, awesome. I I consider it. I consider milestone. it fortunate for everyone involved that I will ne I will never win a pr a proper highfalutin award that would make me that would cause that would require me to wear a suit because if if I'm on camera doing that, you know you should know very well that I will turn that into one giant shit post. <laughs> well, if you're wearing a suit, you lose all credibility. Uh, no, what I'll what what I'd pro what I'd prob what I am I am somebody who would go who would go up in a shirt with the with the back of it saying "fuck the Watsi" and and get and get away with it. <laughs> I'd put stars in it so I'm not a so I'm not actually saying it so the FCC doesn't get on them. But um, the but the the point the point would be made clear. Just most people most people would want to have proper decorum at those sort of things. I. You've seen The Dark Knight, so you're probably familiar with that whole line of some men just want to watch the world burn. Yes. I don't yes. want to watch the world burn. I just want I just want to um I just want to see its ignition point. <laughs> you, you, you want to witness it. You know, ca you know, cause a cause a little bit cause a little bit of craziness. I mean, I, I mean every every GM has a little bit of sadism in them. <laughs> I think that's true. I might have to say that that's true. I mean, especially if you've been doing it too long. And well, <laughs> I was do I was doing it before. I was doing it when I was still in when I was still in middle school. So, yeah, I'd say I've been doing it too long. <laughs> especially, especially since I can threaten my players with bacon soda. <laughs> right, right, right. Don't drink bacon. Well, soda. awesome! Thanks for having me back. <laughs> thank you for com Thank you for coming back. Um. Uh, so it's it's been it's been about a year and change. How have you how have you been holding up, even even with all the shit that's been going on for the last month? <laughs> I, I I had kind of a quiet year. I mean, for a while there, I was doing two, three, sometimes four properties a year. Um, and this year, I kind of I, I dialed it back, and you know, took some time to to play other games that were not my own, mm -hmm. and um, and kind of had a reset. Uh, so it was nice. It was kind of a nice, nice year actually, and I'm ready for more now. Though I feel like I, I have to make up for lost time. Yeah, that's that's completely understandable. Oh. Uh, during that year, I um I was working on um, refining Highcaster. It was what what happened was I wanted to play D and D, but I didn't want to play D and D. I wanted to play the stories in D and D. Like I like I, I I read these adventure paths. I really get compelled by them and excited about them. And I'm like, this is what he, this would be awesome at the table. But then I remember when I get it to the table that you have to wait for everybody to take their turns and you have to pull out the map and you have to draw on the thing and you have to have your minis. And I don't really want to do all that. <laughs> I just want the story. <laughs> so I started tinkering with iCaster uh, so that I could actually play D&D &D modules. It was a fun journey. Mm -hmm. So... And and I I can certainly I can certainly go with that since there's some fascinating settings that I'd lo I'd love to I'd love to explore. It's just that with the with that rule set I don't I don't feel like doing so. Uh, now, dungeon ca dungeon caster is a is a setting is a setting agnostic that's using the caster system that you developed previously with with um high caster. Um. Now you've referred to it yes, as a re you've referred to it as a refinement. So I suppose the I suppose the first question that I, that I should ask is what 
what parts did what parts in high caster did you see did you see the need to refine or is it just a matter of clarifying a lot of the rule set well there was clarification of the rule set the high caster was really um I, I i don't mean this to sound in the way it might but it's really ambitious because it was trying to um bring forward a narrative first story structure to gaming which was is very difficult to do in a systemized way so i i think it was not it could have been articulated better uh, even though i tried my best so there, there there's that but also highcaster was designed for legendary mythological kinds of characters so it was intended to be pretty op the the, the especially when looking at magic or powers or things like that you could, if you, if you want to do, you could just, you know, blow up an entire town. You know, there were, there were no real limits, even, even narratively, there weren't really any limits because you're playing heroes and gods, even demigods of legend. Um, so that system, even though the approach works really great, say on a D and D setting, which I would categorize as more swords and sorcery, um, that is, uh, not going to work there because they're, they're just too. I, I ran it. I, I ran it sort of high caster uh, level with some, with my middle school group, who's now a high school group, and uh, I just let them go high as far as they wanted, and it completely blow up the campaigns to the point where it was really hard to recover. It was still fun, but it definitely didn't do the dungeon delving kind of play that we get used to in D anD. d So that was one of the biggest reasons I needed to refine it so it could work in a sort of sorcery world. Yeah. I, and I can I can certainly understand that since Highcaster lin lends itself more towards um, epic fantasy, and right. that's that is that is nice and all, but sort of things like, about in Greek myths. Mm -hmm. And uh, and there's there's n there's nothing wrong there's nothing wrong with that on paper. Unlike some, I don't I don't have this mindset that you need that there's one style of fantasy to rule them all, but. Eat, but each each particular style of, of fantasy has its own requirements, for lack of a better term. And it's, it sounds like you ended up coming to that conclusion as well. Yeah, and I, I think I foresaw it too. Even in, in Highcaster, there's a section on adapting the rules for different types of fantasy, and there's a hard mode setting, and there was, uh, you know, there, there was something in, in that logic. I just brought it into more clarity and with dungeon caster i mean it was little things like uh, how do i limit magic resources in a game that cares only about the narrative mm -hmm. you know how, how, how does gear matter in a game like that and and i had to be able to answer those questions to really play these these D, &D modules i want to play yeah and for me per for me personally i've all i've always preferred a um a rule set that's that's um right in the middle between being full being full universal and and single setting focused. Uh, what I, what I mean by that is 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 a fantasy setting where where um the say the le the level of magic is something that can be adjusted by the GM as appropriate. So it can shift so it can shift between high, mm -hmm. it can shift between high and low magic. And obvious, obviously, that's it's a tricky affair to do it. Yeah, and I, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just gonna say that's. A, I find that uh, entirely agnostic set. Uh, the rule sets are difficult because you end up having to hack them so much that you may as well just come up with a rule set for it. Mm -hmm. I also come from a PBTA tradition in which you design all of the rules, the are rule set around the setting. Um, and I actually I broke away from that a bit. I started developing over the years, but. Uh, but I think the uh, I think it helps to have a rule set that's genre appropriate. Mm -hmm. Absent. Yeah. Now, nah, of course, of course. Again, I'm not saying go full go full universal, but there's a there's a middle ground that can that that can be found. Um. Now, with the, with that kind of thing in mind, I do. I do. Was there was there any um. Was there anything that was in that was in high caster that that in the in the transfer over to dungeon caster you felt just just wasn't going to work or was there nothing that was that level of egregious? Uh, 
Yeah, actually, I didn't change Highcaster very much, except that I narrowed it uh, and made it more specific. So it's pretty backwards compatible. If you wanted to, you know, presumably a a a, a, a system or a, a setting built in uh, with Dungeon Caster would work in Reverse or Highcaster. It would just be Highcaster on hard mode. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm guessing, and that so I didn't really change much. I'm guessing that you're going to be putting in a um con a conversion guide for in the Dungeon Caster book. The uh it, in a in a way there is a, a conversion guide in Highcaster. Uh, it's just not very uh, it, specifically about magic and, and it also so also about gear and things like that that just weren't out. Mm-hmm. So you could you could just make a high a dungeon caster character and and run it in a high caster game. It would work just fine. There wouldn't really be any conversion. But what's going to happen downstream is it, it, on settings. Like I'm already doing a, a setting for dungeon caster called the worm breaks, which is actually a high caster setting. You'll see rule sets for high caster and for dungeon caster in there because uh, if you want to get a on a sort of on on things like gear and magic, whereas if you just want to play high caster, it's going to be much more general and top level. Yep. So you're going to have to do both because high caster isn't in of itself compatible with dungeon caster, but it is reverse compatible. Mm -hmm. Now, I would like to delve a little bit into her into um, heritages and paths com comparatively. Now, obvious obviously the mm -hmm. obvious obviously there's there's going to be a di there's going to be a different different list, but would he would heritages um still ha still have that format of of look and and an ability? Yeah, and abilities are going to be a little more prescriptive in dungeon caster. So whereas in high caster, your abilities are going to be much more narrative. Like uh, you are. Re I don't know. I'm thinking of. I can't remember any of them. But you're you're good up on this location. You know, might say in dungeon caster is going to be. You can choose from three specific abilities, mm -hmm. and and those abilities usually to add a die to your modifier uh, to help with your rolling. Yeah. Um. However, the uh, the heritages themselves, you know, are 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 just the at least in dungeon caster are going to be the basics you would expect to find in an OSR game. Mm-hmm. Now, when it comes to when it comes to the paths, uh, is was it a was it a case of of tra of transferring a transferring a lot of the benefits of of paths from from one to the other, or were there some were there some that had to be significantly changed in the transference? Uh, it, they were significantly changed. I think that the the paths in Dungeon Caster are, are are pretty different. I mean, they're the same court sort of fantasy classes you would expect, mm -hmm. but they're again much more prescriptive. So in Caster, you might have the uh, um, the the sorcerer and High Caster, the magister, mm -hmm. would have um, very general descriptions of what kinds of magic that they can do. Mm -hmm. Uh, but in Dungeon Caster, there's actually a spell list. Yeah. Um, and, you know, a, 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 a weir is going to have disciplines just like they do in High Caster, but they're, they're, they're very specific, you know, to uh, archery or, you know, whatever they are. So it, it's just more prescriptive, which, again, is why it's backwards compatible, but not necessarily for, like, a, it would be hard to use dungeon caster character in a High Caster game where everybody else is playing High Caster characters because they're going to be much more limited. Mm -hmm. Now, will uh, will te will disciplines work in a work in a similar manner that they did bef that they did beforehand? Yeah, they were exactly the same. the The big discipline is on the magic. The, the, it's really a whole new magic system, but it's it's the disciplines. In every other case, you know, you can do the thing that the discipline describes without spending a discipline die. So let's say you're or a warrior and or a fighter, and you want to use your your bow and arrow. You can totally do that, and you don't have to spend a discipline die. But if you want to, you can spend a discipline die in order to to make your role better. However, if you are a magic user, uh, if you if you want to use magic, you have to use it. 
discipline die, and that that limits the amount of magic that you can use. Uh, and and there's still a whole lot of choice within it, but it's it's still it's it's very limited. So it's um whereas in in high caster proper, just do magic, you know, and again if you wanted to spend in order to make your magic. Mm-hmm. So, Apart from that, disciplines work exactly the yeah. same. So, since we're dealing with a new magic system, let's go. Let's go into that. The way magic worked in um, in Highcaster was on a on a very on a very descriptive um, se- sense, and with this one, we're utilizing a spell list. So, let me get let me get the obvious question out, out of my system. It, when in using the in using this spell list, is it going to is it going to be, um, is it going to be sim- similar to a Vancian spell spell list where you can only have a certain number of spells per day, or is or is it going to be less um restrictive than that? Is it going to be similar to a what? I missed you got cut out a bit. A a Vancian model, where there's a certain number of spe- certain number oh. of spells you have per day, and you've got to prep them in advance. No, no, it's not like that. But there are a finite amount of discipline dice you can use in a day, and when you spend them, you have to recover. So if you are a um, a magic user, uh, you will have, you know, three disciplines of magic you can draw from, and uh, each of those disciplines have uh, D four level spells, D six level spells, and D eight level spells. Mm-hmm. So you could spend your day on a d8 level spell or on a d6 or a d4 um and then and then that'll that'll go to your modifier pool and you can roll um but when you are out of dice you can't you can't cast from that discipline anymore until you recover mm-hmm. uh so you have a a big choice uh a pool to go from but it's it is limited in its currency you know it's it's sort of um and the way it plays out is that you have to get very creative with how you use your magic so it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's way more limiting than high caster. So if you are in a situation where you're, um, you know, you want to use a big fireball, but you've used all of your elemental dice, you have to start looking at illusion and saying, okay, well, what what, what can I do here? Because <laughs> I don't have any more discipline for my elemental magic. Mm-hmm. Which the now given given that what are the what are these for lack of a better term these spheres of magic. Uh, they, the conjuration element um, illusion are the ones on on the magic user, and then the, uh, there are others for the um, the cleric, which is uh, uh, I don't have them in front of me, but they are you know your your cleric style like wrath and you know the the, the smiting, and then there's the, the healing kinds of kind of magic, but it's all agnostic, so it's it's designed to be sort of just your basic principles of of traditional fantasy magic. And then those can be repurposed for whatever your setting is. Mm-hmm. So, with that with that in mind, I, since Ranger is one of the paths, I do. This is one question that I ha, I have my own stance on, and so, and some of my colleagues vehemently disagree with me on this. To it, to which I say, it's a free country, and you are free to be wrong. But <laughs> the result, but there's been the debate about whether or not Rangers. <laughs> Should be half casters. I've argued no. Um, some folk have argued have argued yes because they because of the fact that they dip into that. Do we have rangers who dip into not into knowledge of lo- of localized magic and the like? I <clears throat> I think I think that I think that that only that that only works with cer- with certain with certain rangers and it's still very um, loose. But what's but what is your stance on it? Do would rangers have a ma- have a limited form of magic, or are they st- or strictly not? No, they're definitely not magical. Uh, they they can hunt, they can track. They're good at finding their way around terrain. Um, they're they're not gonna they're, you're not gonna get lost in the overland rules that are built if you have a ranger with you. But no, they don't cast magic. Now they, they, you could you could multi-class potentially, and I have in in our D and D game we had a multi-class uh, cleric. I know he was, I think, a cleric ranger, and it worked fine. But uh, default, no. And truth be told, I'm not I'm not a fan of of some folks' mindset of 
ju oh, just add just add magic to make a to make a given archetype interesting. That's how that's how you end up getting the right, Babby's right. the Babby's first character um, stereotype with martial characters. Right. Yeah, I I agree. I I think it's um because of story first. There's a lot. It, you know, it's hard to have a, an uninteresting class. Um, I, I the people who tend to play rangers who have no preconceived notion of a ranger are looking to play the you know the wilderness scout. And yeah. I, I think like in the in the last game I was talking about same same campaign, one of the dads of the group, not any of these games before, wanted to play a wilderness guy, and that was perfect for him. Uh, but if you're going into ranger expecting like you know wow or I don't know something else, <laughs> you, you you're not going to see that kind of gameplay. It's it's the uh, it's the guide, it's the one that goes in first, it's the one that that tracks that animals, yeah, that kind of thing. I have. I have jo I have joked in the past that people who wanted to play ra wanted to play ranger well have um, it's very clear it's very clear that in, even in the early days they w they wanted to be Legolas. Um, I think I I think in I think in some, in yeah, some regards right. they should <laughs> th th I should ex that that should be expanded into saying if you're playing if you're playing a ranger you want you you watched Rambo First Blood and you wanted to do that. <laughs> right that's funny exactly yeah i think um you know druid is not in this uh initial dungeon caster set but that would be more of like the one i think people think of in terms of ranger these days i i, I don't know i i kind of had an osr lens when designing this yeah and i've um i have a love-hate relationship with with a lot of folks in osr Lar largely because I think too too many of them hyper focus on the right way to play, and I'm I don't do that. Yeah, I agree. It's whatever is right for your table. You know, that's the right way to play. And in, in some in some of it, it's 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 largely in in the right way to do fantasy, which. Only only ends up reinforcing my belief that a lot of people have a very lim have a very limited um, understanding of um, fantasy. In this, yeah, it's the uh, it's the same uh, it's the same thing we've been seeing ever since Tolkien came up with it, you know, and it's just a Western European um, mythological approach to to fantasy, and and there's so much more out there and available. I think the um, uh, I think that that, that it would be great to be, you know breaking some of these conventions, bringing different viewpoints mm -hmm. and stories. That and I think I think a lot of people could 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 um do could do with looking at looking at certain th looking at certain things that we that we um. That we that we've accepted as the way you're supposed to do things, and and ask is that is that really the case, or have we just talked ourselves into it? Yeah, that's a good point. I, I think that was actually a lot of behind the design of Highcaster was really trying to find something that was, um, I suppose, compatible with how people view fantasy, but taking it into places that you might not be used to seeing. Like you know, yes, you can play a unicorn. And we're going to be focused on on cultures and their interactions, not on you know uh, kicking down doors and stealing loot. Uh, and and I think that there's a lot of room. Just as a history nut myself, there's a lot of room just from our own human history to draw from. That doesn't include you know circa 1100 to 1300 Britain. Mm -hmm. There's a whole there's... world out there, and and it'd be cool to see some more of that. Yeah, and there's. I want to make clear there's nothing ostensibly wrong with that with that style of right. that style of fantasy but I resent the idea that that's what has to be done. Right. Yeah. It is not that is not the only way to do it. And it's a it's a perfectly fine way. I play in that in that genre setting all the time. It's one of my favorites. In fact, British history is my favorite kind of history. But it's just, it'd be cool to see other points of view. 
and you know other stories other histories and you know like coyote and crow is a good example it is really really great fantasy in, in a sort of what if setting but all based on indigenous let me let me raise you one with let me, let me raise you one with a classic think, that has you that has used a is used a certain tagline for over for over 20 years that is Talislanta and its policy of no elves. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great one. That's a great one. I like the board game too. I never played the board game. I'm only familiar with the with the RPG end of things. And yeah. Then, yeah, it's 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 a classic for a reason. But I I think it if if there wasn't that assumption that we've ta that we've talked about, it wouldn't need to use that tagline. Right. <laughs> yeah, it's true. <laughs> Yeah, I, I definitely am seeing more innovation on the uh, indie side, um, and and I think um, as a lot of this drama is unfolding uh, with 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 Watsi and the D and D property now, I, I have a feeling we're going to see a lot more. And so, creating Dungeon Caster was a way of like, here's an alternative way of running games that you know doesn't have to be uh, the same way that you're used to, and that is focused especially more on how streamers play. And some and some podcasters where you're, they're really they're they're obviously more focused on the characters and their interactions than they are on you know the tactics of gameplay. There are plenty of games that do tactics really well. Dungeon Caster doesn't do tactics. That's not why it was designed. It it does it does, uh, you know you know the uh, what is getting in the way of characters' motivations thing, mm -hmm. and uh, but it allows you to play in a tactical environment, which I think is what makes it so fun. On the Kickstarter, I started doing videos. I did one today on um, a Red Dragon confrontation. Mm -hmm. And it was so much fun to just play out because I was just sort of half handing it, you know, as we were going just to show how it worked. And it was clear that, you know, this dwarf in the scenario needed to get past the Red Dragon and know this while this was a combat situation, it was more about, you know, finding their way around the dragon while things were escalating. And over the next couple of days, I'm going to do another video where you're in actually in a combat zone with, you know, basically a battlefield outside of a sieged city. What does that look like? Mm -hmm. uh, and so you can still have all of those, all those combat things that you want, except it becomes much more cinematic and, 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 and way more, you know, instead of waiting for waiting your turn, you're, you're, you're involved in a story. And that's, that's what I was after, uh, that kind of gameplay. And I think that this provides a good alternative now that people are looking for other systems. Yeah. And it's, I I also noted that uh, that on the Kickstarter page you have a um you have you have you have a you have um I I believe you had, you were ah English you were referring to the rule set as as open source and I hmm. I can't help but get the feeling that some of that is in response to recent events I'll put it that way. Oh sure, yeah, yeah. It was prompted by that. I had this sitting and ready to go. Uh, I actually, I don't know honestly while I was waiting. I think I was, I, I don't know why I was waiting because I had it all ready to go, laid out and designed. I had to because I was running games with it. And then when the OGL fiasco happened, I was like, well, I need to put this out now. It, why am I waiting? And I did, and and it definitely was prompted by that. Mm -hmm. Now, I use language like, you know, it's okay. going to be published in Creative Commons. It's revocable. Mm -hmm. You know, there's nothing I can do about that now. It's out there, you know, and that's that, that, that was all by design. Yeah. Now, with that, with that kind of thing in mind, what are you shooting for as far as the page count for the book, for the book? It is 122 pages. It's actually already off to get proofed, so I might have uh, a finished book in hand in a couple of weeks. Uh, so yeah, it's it's not insubstantial, but it's not huge. And I did put in a stretch goal for the first setting, which is already well underway. Um, and this, what this, if I reach ten thousand, that'll actually give me the margin I need to front load it and and do it sooner. Um, and that is, uh, you know, you know, going to add a whole lot more content. But this is, uh, it's a rules. It's not a full blown like, you know, setting with rule. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, even with the even ideas, with... You, the ideas you'll create your own settings. Mm -hmm. 
Although, do you plan on putting a few pages of of like mini settings to just give to just give examples for players and GMs? I hadn't, but now that you bring it up, you know, it might be worthwhile uh, having supplements that do that. I was trying to keep the core text very, you know, these are the rules and how to play. Yeah. Um, but there's no reason why I couldn't include, you know, this is what it looks like to have a setting in here. Um, and not, not and actually, that's set. one of the reasons I wanted to put... Not a full-on setting, yeah, but just a, like a, a one-page, um, just a one-page seed. Um, not the end has Not the end has done that plenty of times. Sure, and then also I, I think it'd be good to see a, a an adventure sketch. Which adventures have to be designed differently with the system. Mm -hmm. um, it can't. The adventures really can't be prescriptive. They'd be much more like you know uh, World of Darkness adventures, where you show the whole landscape and everybody involved, and then it's up to you what you do with it. Um, but I, I think that I would like to include some of that as well. Yeah, um, the rules themselves are kind of prescriptive in how you. Um, how you run adventures and that, you know, there's, there's rules, overland travel rules and things like that, that help, you know, you could just out of the box, just play something in a generic setting and be fine. Mm -hmm. I also think that, um, the setup focus strike of L5R's mo modules is, in, is an interesting one to build around. Oh yeah. That's a good idea. I didn't even think of that. Uh, of that's why I pay you the big bucks. <laughs> that's the the other the other <laughs> format is. Um, I know a lot of people would think would think of using a a three act play format, but I think it'd be interesting to build a format around the um, key show ten cats um, for, um, format that's seen in Japan. Which is a kind is. And it's not just it's not just Japan. It's China and Korea that also use it. I'm just more familiar with the um, Japanese version. But it's basic. It's basically introduction, development, twist, conclusion. Is the is the best way to um to, to describe it. And I'll send I'll send you a link to the Wikipedia page that sh that shows it. And I'm I'm not saying it'd be I'm not saying it'd be perfect for this kind of thing, but it is something worth exploring. Especially with the whole taking taking different angles to fa to fantasy or to storytelling. Okay, cool. But, yeah, like I like I said, it's not it's not something that. I can get. I can guarantee would wor would work for for ad for every adventure, but it is something worth considering. Oh. I just think it'd be an interesting challenge since everybody knows the three act structure in one form or another. All right. Yeah, having. I mean, the the roots of the skill set all all the way back to great American novel, which was entirely a literary approach. Uh, to building sessions, it'd be cool to see see what you know what could be expanded on. Yeah. Now, I do want to offer my congratulations on managing to just smash through your initial goal because you were only asking for five hundred and you're getting close to six thousand, and you still got time to spare. Yeah. That was honestly very surprising. I really just wanted to recoup some costs. I didn't expect it to take off like that. So it's been wonderful. Mm -hmm. And I, I you know, a lot of the backers came from prior, mm -hmm. which I thought was interesting. Well, if if you've got it's it's like it's a Pavlovian thing. If you've got if you if you can if you um if you build if you build rapport, it's easier to get them to come back. Right, right. If you continue to deliver on what you say you're going to do, uh, so hope on that. And um, I that there is probably uh, an appetite, especially now for uh, games that are are clear for narrative style play. And I I think that I love tactical games. I'm a fan, uh, but sometimes I just want to tell a story. 
and Dungeon Cast are you to do that with you no know, those piles of PDFs that you probably have on your computer but have never bothered. Um, you have you have no idea how deep that hole goes. <laughs> <laughs> I had to install a whole new drive on my computer to hold them. Um, I haven't had i I have not I have not had to go that go that far, but I've gone but I have gone close. Uh, if some <laughs> the jo the joke that I often say is, this, is whenever somebody asks how many how many character sheets I not character sheets just how many um, PDFs I have, the answer is yes. I have all of the PDFs, every one of them. Oh, it's also I've stopped also... downloading them. I just accept them and drive through. So drive through for me. Well, there's there's also the there's also the fact that because because there because there's so many I um because because I bet because I research and back so many different so many different projects I have to organize them in a in a way that some people would find insane. <laughs> I keep even when it comes to campaign settings for different de for <laughs> or different genius people. depending on... genius and ins and insanity is ju is just a matter of perspective <laughs> right <laughs> also a gamma ray song but that's another story <laughs> but I know you I know yeah I'd be happy with how the project is going mm-hmm Yeah, and I, I I'm certainly going to be looking forward to seeing how how it would how it would work, especially since the it's on, it's only a matter of time before before I look at it and go, okay, but can it monk? <laughs> yeah, I I you know monk is my favorite. And so it's not that long. I think I, one of the things I want to do are really, you know, release other classes, but I have to decide how I should say paths. I have to decide, you know, in what context. And um, I think there's going to be some that is going to be given away to the community, and there are going to be some that are part of settings or adventure paths, things like that. Uh, but one's high on my list. That and, and Druid. Yeah, I ha I have my own idea. I have my own ideas, especially since. The the idea of of some of somebody being able to being able to kick ass without weapons just as well as those who can is always gonna, is always going to be interesting to me. Plus, it's within it's within my gimmick. But it's it's one that only that most um even most even most games that could be considered OSR screw up. And I know why I know why they screw it up, and it's usually the same mistake because it's usually the same mistakes every single time. Um, chief among chief among them is treating martial arts as treating unarmed martial arts as a one size fits all in the design. When you look you look at any you look at any martial arts film or the like, and that's not the case. It would it would be it would be. It would be it would be like saying that there's no that there's no difference between someone wielding a longsword and someone wielding a battle axe. Oh. And yeah, th yeah, there's yeah, there's the nar there's the narrative thing, but Narr but you can narrative and mechanics shouldn't be completely divorced from each other. So, I know I know that there is quite a bit quite a bit of time remaining. Um, what are you shooting for as far as a release window? Well, the uh, the book is ready to go. In fact, I've just sent it off uh, to get a physical proof, and um, I'm aiming to have the book done and in hands by the end of March. So it's a month after the campaign ends, no later. Mm -hmm. um, if I reach ten thousand, that's going to add another. Um, a setting to the project, which would go into July probably, but um, the core game is 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 ready. In, in fact, like I said, I've been sitting on it, um, and 
without a really good reason. <laughs> I'd like to take it through another proof and make sure there are no mistakes, but it should be ready to go. Mm -hmm. and I, I do like believe I do believe in the Kickstarter is to have everything done as done as possible, as I don't ever want to be under pressure to having to fulfill. So that's sort of just my guiding principle in general. It's a fair point. And I will certainly be looking forward to seeing how it develops, especially since, like I, like I said, because of how this is set up, I can see myself hacking the holy hell out of it, like I do with, <laughs> every, like I do with just about every game I own. I hope you do. I'd love to see hacks. I think it would be great. Because oh. especially if, it, if I want to do some of the stuff that I usually do with fantasy, I'm going, I'm going to hack. I'm going to have to hack it. Oh. Just be, just because. Whenever when I remember I bit of bit of a tangent, but I've but I've often heard the line of you can use the most you can use the most litigious fantasy role playing game to run any kind of fantasy, and I say, all right, how all right how am I supposed to run, how am I supposed to use this if I want to run a um a feudal Japan style style fantasy without bringing up Oriental adventures? If you do that, you automatically <laughs> lose because you said. All I need is that. All I need is this core set in, in order to do that. All right. <laughs> yeah. 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 How do you, especially when, I mean, if you're playing it honestly, there isn't a lot of combat until the combat means you're going to die. Well, the the um cannot, the thing that I often bring with the, bring on that is the most common way to equip a fighter or 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 a, or a pal or a paladin or what have you is the sword and board method. Mm -hmm. So how are you going to do that in a culture that doesn't really use shields? Right. Or where there's one sound, one sword per town. Even even if the, even if there is the one even putting aside the one sword per per town, the shield thing is the is the bigger um issue in this case. And I don't let I do not care for the idea of just of just reskinning say a long sword to have it be a katana. Mm -hmm. I don't even like the idea of reskinning a bastard sword to be to, to do that. <laughs> You're it's lipstick on a pig. Yeah. So if I'm so if I'm going to be doing that, if I'm going to be doing that style of fantasy with 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 these sort of systems, there's going to be some hackery. There has there has to be it's even more so when it comes to magic. Right. Like the, the and even if you're even if you're playing like a Tolkien version fantasy, I mean what. How are you going to play a, a, a game predicated on tactical combat when you're a hobbit running from ring wraiths? Even now, if you're that's... even if you're not that, how are you going to handle the fact that magic is that magic is not as ubiquitous as yes. it is in, as as it is in most fantasy settings? And that's something I that's something I covered when I did my retrospective on Lord of the Rings RPGs. Yes, it, like, it, it's rare and dangerous and and completely mysterious. Mm-hmm. And just being able to lay, just being able to lay on hands is something is something that you is re, is rarely is rarely seen in any of the books. And the per, and the people who do it do it are freaking kings. Yeah. Right. Uh, or or people in that level of high standing, not the not the underdog story that you often see with um the with what's considered typical fantasy. And you see, and that was that was an issue I had with, with um, with both Merp and Lord and Decipher Lord of the Rings. Mm -hmm. The One Ring doesn't really have that problem. In fact, you ha in fact you have to go out of your way to even you to even oh, use magic in that system. Like it's not it's it's not easy to get a hold of. If at if at all, most of the time, you, most of the time at best, you'd get you might be able to get some magic items if you're lucky, and that's. And e and even that you can't see it, but I'm doing massive finger quotes with that. <laughs> right, right. Well, that's the way it should be done, you know. And if and if it is even kind of in the tradition of D and D, you know, if we remember in the early editions, it it was kind of hard to do magic until you became very powerful. Then it was very easy. But but there's always this sort of uh, you know I have it's a it's a it's a, a resource that will run out. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know that kind of approach to magic is I think always more fun 
uh, than you know just the nuking that you get in MMOs. I mean, that's kind of fun too, I guess. But I, if it depends on, on, I suppose, what you're signing up for. Yeah, and oh, rec- recently I did a um, I did a live stream about adapting Dark Souls into tabletop, and I said whichever system you use, you're gonna have to do some hackery, and any system that involves full on classes is going to have problems. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. Um, I, I, you know, I, I, I bet Morkborg would work for that. Thinking out loud. No. No, Mor- no, Mork- Morkborg would Morkborg would not work out. Um, largely, largely because there's still way, there's still way too much, way too way too much D, way too much DNA of what of what came before and. Um. There is st- there is still there is still some, f- its its method of advancement isn't qu- isn't quite compatible, isn't is is still is still is a little bit too restrictive I guess. That that's the reason why I, w- I was against using I was against using Morkborg. Um, there's also the fact that it does, it's not fully classless. Um. If I'm being, I've su- I've suggested using something like Sword World or Warrior Rogan Mage, personally. Hmm. Uh, especially since now there's been a fan translation of Sword World 2.5. You're still gonna have to hack it, but still, but it's possible. But that's a, that's a story for another day. So <laughs> sure, with, sure. With all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for coming all the way to my temple once again and enjoying the uh, madness that happens around here, even if it means braving the hell of time zones. <laughs> yes. Oh, yes, the time zones. Well, I, I appreciate you having me. It, it was fun last time, it was fun this time, and hopefully you'll have me back. Mm-hmm. And, and anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, and I will. Uh, I will see you hopefully next time. Yep. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay. Fucking frosty, everybody!